Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great, cool. Uh, so let's get started. Feel free to scooch up if you want in the back of the room or, you know, stay in the back of the room either way. All right. So this is my talk uh, on the switch as a server. Why should you listen to me? Uh, I am Leslie Carr. I'm an operations engineer. I've worked at lots of big websites. Some of you may have heard of uh, and use all the time. And then um, about a year ago now, I decided to join Cumulus Networks because uh, I thought they were doing really cool stuff. Cumulus uh, Linux is a Debian-based distribution for network switches. So I'm sure plenty of you know and love Debian. Or you might be Red Hat people. Uh, <laughs> and the whole idea is that you should be able to manage your network switch just like you can your server. Use all of your existing Linux tools to manage your switches. And our current release is based on Weezy, but we are planning on uh, moving up to Jesse once that uh, is pushed to stable, which should be any day now. Uh, we run on Broadcom chipset switches. Uh, we have six vendors right now, uh, Agama, Dell, Edgecore, HP, Penguin, and Quanta. Um, the whole idea is that, just like with your servers, right, you don't buy a Red Hat server. You buy a server from whoever, you put Red Hat on it. Um, you know, or switches should be exactly the same thing. Um, and yeah. Uh, now, who here has dealt with the traditionally installing and dealing and configuring switches? Sure, plenty of you, right? It it sort of sucks. The, the, the traditional process is it comes pre-installed with usually old software, a couple releases behind. They have to telnet sometimes or serial into the box. Telnet, I mean, it's 2015. And you use TFTP to put the new image on, which a lot of times then means, oh great, you have to find a, make a TFTP server. Uh, and you enable SSH. Sometimes you have to use a password. You can't even use a key. Once again, it's 2015. Uh, copy and paste configuration. And then th your automation is usually restricted to Perl scripts and expect. So how many of you had to write horrific, painful Perl scripts to deal with this? Yeah, right? And sometimes even like having to have the password to have it paste in manually. It, it sucks, but you know, compare that to servers, right? Servers are great. You reboot, you know, the Pixie catches the installer automatically. Sure, TFTP is a boot image over. The new image is pulled over by whichever means you, you desire. Your, your post in script runs. Then your automation software manages configuration administration. You probably don't even have to log in once. Excuse me. Uh, it's all done, right? It's, which is great. So why can't network gear be like this? we thought. Uh, so we wrote Oni. Um, it's a network OS installer, uh, discovery and execution, sort of you know, BIOS, Pixie, Kickstarter, all in one. We use BusyBox, and uh, it has been donated to the Open Compute Project, so anyone can use it, open source. If you go to oni.org, you can see all the documentation, download everything. Um, so the, in the installation process with Oni is much more like a server process, right? Look, it has a discover process, look for installer. It will try uh, USB, if, if you have a USB stick plugged into the front of the box, or uh, DHCP, IPv6, neighbor discovery, or it also will try to TFTP to a well-known, uh, uh, a uh, statically configured address. Um, it will then search for the file name and try to execute that installer. Um, so uh, it uh, so it will look for starting at oni dash installer dash the hardware and there's there's a whole waterfall you can you can look up on oni.org um, as well it uses a HTTP request so it sends headers to the web server that include the serial number MAC address and some other identifying information so if you want you can write some type of type of server to depending on uh, your HTTP request to send a different image out, if, if you so desire, or perhaps a different kickstart script. Um, once after the image is fetched, it's then saved and executed on the switch. Um, if you look here, here are the headers that are sent over. Uh, when, um, and so when, uh, after it's been installed, when Cumulus Linux uh, tends to DHCP over its management interface, it will request option 239. Um, this option is then used to uh, to specify a custom provisioning script. Uh, we, call it, we call it zero touch provisioning. Just think of it, you know, more like a kickstart script. Um, 
And here are the headers so that once again you can have some system in place to make a custom kickstart script. The script executes as root and it does not execute until it sees the cumulus dash auto provisioning flag. Um, so you, and you can use any of the following languages. Um, I, I usually wind up just writing bash scripts because that's, that's, that's the easiest, but uh, Perl, Python, Ruby, um, don't do Go yet, but maybe. And here's an example of a VTP script. Also, feel free, if you have any questions, to just stop me at any time. You don't, don't have to wait till the end. Um, you can see here, just your normal bash script, right? Bash, uh, trapping errors, just because I like to see where a uh, script has failed, if it has failed, uh, because I'm lazy and I don't want to have to try to go through line by line, so this will tell you. Um, just editing the repo, uh, you can see it's a normal apt repo, it's just like Debian. Uh, installing Puppet, con you know, configuring it just to start at, at boot, and uh, service Puppet restart will then trigger a Puppet run uh, so that the switch will configure on its own. And then you can see uh, exit zero. Exit zero is also quite important because when the script, if the script has exited successfully on exit zero, then uh, it will set a, it will set a little flag saying auto provision of successful equals true. So it's basically just like a server OS, right? You get BIOS Pixie, server OS, all the apps, same thing, bootloader and Oni, network OS, and all your apps, done. And I am going to show you a video on this. Um, it's about two minutes. Um, parts have been sped up just because, uh, you know, we don't want to sit here all day. Uh, in reality, the process takes about 10 minutes. Um, and I did a set dash x on the VTP bash script just so we can see what's going on. So here we go, rebooting the system. Um, you can see it looks like just your normal, your normal BIOS bootloader. Um, the platform there, uh, it just has a little platform detection uh, that's set in firmware. Uh, so it double checks that when you, uh, when you set an ONI installer file, that it is a supported platform because that's because there's PowerPC and x86, and you know if you try to install one on the other, it will just fail. Um, you can see it's DHCPing, you know, requesting the file. Um, you can see right there it's uh, formatting the hard drive, something everyone is quite familiar with. Uh, the ONI installer file actually is basically just a little bash script uh, before the binary. If you unpack any ONI installer file, you'll, you'll just see, you know, you see the bash script and then this lovely blob of letters that that is the binary. Um, it installs and there's two image slots in all the switches. It's something in serverland you never have a primary and backup, but in network gear it's a very traditional thing. So if you have a upgrade that goes wrong, you can roll back to the other partition. Uh, we just use partitions. Uh, so then you also can mount the other partition if you want, um, just so you can have the file system. Um, there you go, you see it's installed and it's running. And if you see there is the VTP script. Um, and there you go, done, yay. Uh, oh, and uh, yeah, and then I also have, I have it doing a app get update and upgrade uh, automatically. Um, so as everyone is used to that, and now done. <laughs> and I did service Puppet, so I could then show you the next step without Puppet uh, automatically going. <coughs> because we're Debian based, we can do everything via Puppet, uh, users, interface configuration, and routing software. Um, I'm using Quagga in these examples, but you can use Bird, ExaVGP, you could write your own, uh, if you really are a you know, glutton for punishment. Uh, this will take about a minute. Um, this video will take about a minute. Again, once again, I've sped it up because uh, many of you have seen Puppet Runs, and if you haven't, you can always look on YouTube. They aren't quite as exciting. So there, if you, if you see there, this is sort of the nothing up my sleeve. Uh, the routing table just has the default routes. Uh, OSPF isn't running. Uh, PTM daemon is not running. And there we're starting Puppet. See all of the uh, lovely functions syncing over. Um, Bax, uh, 
you know, we uh, have actually uh, written a couple of factor facts that are in factor 2.1, um, just you know, making sure that it correctly detects uh, the software. And um, I believe PubMed at the time did not have the idea of having so many interfaces because most servers don't have 48 interfaces, go figure. Uh, yeah, and you see there, puppets run, everything's configured, OSPF is up, uh, yeah, and all the routes are up. So there you go, instead of having to cut and paste, you can just be lazy, start your puppet run. But then again, not everyone uses puppet, so I figured I will show you the same thing in Ansible. Um, because it's because Ansible is a push model, um, I'm just gonna I'm running this on four switches at once, just because it's pretty easy. Um, probably should have uh, increased the size of that a bit. Uh, yeah, so once again, you can see on all the switches, nothing is running. They only have the management route. You know, uh, don't have any bridges up, and we just have an Ansible playbook runs with uh, the gathering facts, configuring some users. Uh, installs the license and restarts the main uh, switching process, switch D, that just uh, pushes all of the routes into hardware because you don't want to do all of your routing and switching in software. <coughs> you know, configuring PTM, configuring your network interfaces, <coughs> uh, Quagga, of course, to configure and restart it, reloading networking, you know, all, all these things. Um, one thing I love about all configuration management is that it's just as easy to uh, configure one switch as it is to configure 100 switches. Because I think that all of the best sysadmins should be properly lazy at heart. And hey, but what's lazier than running a single command? Well, I guess lazier would be having an intern to run the single command. But you know, that's, that's the, that's the uh, advanced class. I'll be giving that talk next year. <laughs> And as you can see, uh, OSPF is running, PTM is running, uh, we, have, uh, we have all the routes. And there you go. You, you just set up your new uh, data center. So, okay, cool, that's pretty cool, but you know, this is a Debian box. Let's do more. How can we make it even better? So how many of you have gone to install a new data center or a pop and there hasn't the connectivity hasn't been in, gotten in yet? It's, it's pretty common, right? And then you're always cursing your project manager, like, why didn't they send me next week? I need my internet. There's no cell signal. It's a, we're in a concrete box. So we can make one of these an interim puppet server. Uh, since this is a switch, which is a specialized piece of hardware, it does have a small hard drive and limiting processing power. So you probably wouldn't want to do this long term. Um, the switching, all the switching uh, does take priority. So uh, if the CPU is pegged, it will, uh, it will um, uh, put off or kill processes uh, that are not switching, switching or routing related. But, you know, hey, you've, you've, got, a you've got a new rack. You have limited connectivity. There you go. Make it the puppet master. Yep. Oh. <laughs> yep. Is it customizable as far as what gets killed when the CPU is pegged? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, you can customize that in Monit. But um, I think sw the switching is hard coded that it always takes priority. So that is not. Um, and if you would prefer to have a puppet master take priority, then you should probably just buy a server. <laughs> But yeah, um, so here's the topology I'm showing. Um, you can see uh, there's two switches. We're just having one as the puppet master. And this video is going to be about 30 seconds. It took about two minutes in reality. But once again, don't want to have to wait all day. So if you see on the left, uh, there's the, uh, I believe that's the Apache logs for the puppet master. And then on the right is the switch. And I'm using PMUX because I like PMUX. Um, switch from screen a little while ago. There you go. See, it's thinking over all the files, sending over lots of information, configuring everything, and done. 
<coughs> and then let's say, all right, you're still in the data center, waiting, waiting for your friend to get back. What else can you do? You can have some fun. Look at this. You can play Tetris. And I did speed this video up just to make me look like a better Tetris player. All right, so awesome. We got everything working. Yay, our life is so much easier. Um, that's pretty cool, right? But we're still using you know, the same tools and we've made our life pretty good, but I think we can make it even better. So uh, I'm sure any of you have used Debian, you know, written plenty and SC network interfaces. And existing network interface managers are really optimized for desktop and hypervisors, right? Uh, the for things that only have a couple of interfaces. Uh, the complexity increases as your number of interfaces increase and number of VLANs increase. Um, you, for network interfaces, can, there's a lot of dependencies and you must make sure that you have everything in the right order. If you don't, it will fail. It won't tell you why it failed, because you know, your bridge might not come up if you, hadn't, uh, if you haven't already established all of the previous interfaces. There's um, <coughs> a lack of support for just doing incremental changes. Right, like in a, in a switch, a lot of times you wanna add a VLAN maybe, or a couple other ports, and you don't wanna have to bring down all of your networking. On a server, that one port is probably, you know, its only port, so you don't necessarily mind if you have to bring down that interface because you have to make the change. Um, and then there's no tool to query and, valid and validate your running interface configurations. So, you know, in switches, right, like you've got a lot of interfaces, ports, bridges, bonds, lot bonds, VLANs, there's all these different interface attributes. Uh, you can you know, you have your IP addresses, uh, bridge configuration, spanning tree. I know everyone hates spanning tree, but sometimes it is useful uh, or, or needed. Um, IGMP, and usually it's a static configuration. You usually aren't using DHCP on your switches. Uh, you can, but it's you know, usually not. So, and everyone knows IF up down, what I've just been talking about. It is, you know, it does use uses native Linux tools, very well known. Everyone's been using it forever. It does have excellent documentation. Um, but all, all, all configuration knowledge has is a burden on the user, right? Uh, it doesn't do any checking for you, doesn't understand the idea of sub interfaces. Um, it can create, you can have to have incredibly large files if you have a bunch of interface configs, um, no support for incremental updates, uh, and you know, there are some bugs. <coughs> so we wrote uh, IF up down 2. It's a new implementation of IF up down in Python. It is completely open source, available on GitHub. Um, it's backwards compatible, so you can use your same C network interfaces file. Uh, it continues to use all of the existing native Linux tools. We didn't want to rewrite any of that. Um, it supports large numbers of interface attributes. Uh, we also have uh, Python modules as well that you can interact with for interface configuration uh, if you want to write any of those tools. Uh, and the best, the, my favorite part is there we made IF reload. So it acts you know, like a hub instead of a restart, right? Like when you're, uh, like Apache is my favorite example. Right, you, you added a new a new website. You just want to reload just to get the new site up. You don't want to have to take down everything. So if you want to compare uh, some language, here you go. This is just for one interface, to have a sub interface and in a VLAN, uh, and you know, and setting its speed. And then an IF up down two. There's the same configuration. Um, you know, it knows that. Uh, it basically, it, it makes a little tree, which I actually have right here. So it knows about uh, dependencies that you know you have to make a sub-interface, things like that. Um, uh, and yeah, um, there's a bunch of tools built in. Um, this, uh, it actually will output a dot dot file. So you can make nice little pretty graphs like that if you so desire of, of your net network interfaces. And um, yeah, and so you don't need to specify sub-interfaces and things like that. Uh, it also uses Mako templating, um, so which is really useful when you're trying to configure, you know, 20 interfaces at once, right? If especially if they're all the same, you can do ranges, you can do lots of more advanced templating, and uh, you also 
uh, can verify that the template works um, before you actually load it up. Uh, it also does work on servers. Um, we've tested it out on Weezy, Ubuntu, 1204, and 1404. Um, and we would love for anyone else testing on their own servers to uh, let us know how it goes. Uh, you can find out more uh, on GitHub, uh, IF up down to PPM, the code that I was using, um, all of our open source contributions. Uh, we have a bunch of kernel patches. We have upstreamed them all, but uh, not all of them have been accepted yet. Uh, we all know, you know, kernel development is not very fast, as it probably shouldn't be very fast, right? You want to make sure everything works well. Um, and I am on Twitter, and I gave this presentation very fast. Um, that is it. All right. So, uh, any questions about this, Linux networking in general? Uh, when you so the question was when you reload the OS does it interrupt forwarding? Uh, yes, it does. Um, that has been a little bit of an internal debate, uh, but uh, when we do a reload, we decided to make it do you know everything just like this, just like a normal server. So that does restart everything. Uh, Uh, so the question was, when you insert a module like an SFT, is that dependent on the OS, or does the hardware take care of that? Um, so uh, assuming the SFT, there, there always is a problem, assuming the SFT does match normal standards, um, the OS will, uh, will automatically take care of that. Uh, you do have to set, uh, it doesn't do auto detection for one versus 10 gig, so if you put a one gig module in a 10 gig interface, you have to use these tools to set the speed. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, we've, we've tried with a lot of SFTs, but as everyone knows, there's, you know, millions of different kinds, and we haven't been able to get them all. But yeah, but uh, actually one of the biggest problems with SFTs is something I'll say, oh yeah, this, this does match all the standards, and then you'll find out, uh, you know, in this little firmware, it won't actually send all the proper information, or sometimes it'll send it wrong. Uh, so there's, there's two guys that their entire job is basically just dealing with all the new crazy SFTs we've discovered. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so the question was, have we thought of virtualization so that uh, if we wanted to reboot one, like having two OSs sort of running simultaneously, so if we wanted to reboot one, it would sort of fail over to the hot spare. Uh, we had considered some ideas like that. Our biggest thought was actually more like when you're rebooting, um, just keeping all the power on to the actual switching uh, forwarding layer, but uh, we have not attempted anything like that yet. Um, trying to go more for just uh, simplicity, just like Linux, um, yeah. Uh, is it primarily layer two? Uh, nope, we do layer three. Uh, routing, uh, you know, OSPF, BGP, uh, all of that. Um, I personally like layer three networks a bit better using, uh, you know, like using the sort of cloth that leaf spine topology, um, just because I, I've been bitten by, you know, spanning tree and loops and things like that in my past plenty. Uh, and, you know, someone plugging into the wrong port and then all of a sudden you have a loop. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, like, well, so what do you mean specifically by application to layer? Okay. Um, no, uh, you can use QoS, but uh, we do not have any um, like you know per application. Um, yeah, we, we, you, you could you could use QoS and you could use IP tables to mark you know something coming from a port as QoS. Whatever. Yeah? So is everything operate uh, on the system that way directly, or is it still with the layer? Uh, so IP table, uh, IP tables does operate uh, on the switching hardware. So what we do is uh, use IP tables, and then 
then the tool uh, sort of uh, translates it into the Broadcom languages and then uh, pushes that down to hardware. Uh, because, you know, the, I, if we had to try to do IP tables at line rate in the CPU, we would need a very powerful CPU. Um, <laughs> yes, so uh, the Broadcom chipset does have a limited uh, amount of state memory, so I would not recommend a stateful firewall, stateless, totally, but, uh, you know, but there's, uh, there's chipset limitations. So uh, it's not, it definitely is not best for a stateful firewall. I get a different uh, specialized hardware for that. All right. Uh, oh, yes. This is more data center sensitive. Do you have recommend anything for the packet control? Um, if I remember from the presentation from earlier. Well, I mean, uh, it is more data center centric, but you could use it for a campus network. We have one gig, ten gig, and forty gig. So, yeah. Um, uh, one thing, though. Uh, yeah, we don't have any special port level security. Um, so yeah, if you, especially if you want to do more advanced features, uh, this would not be the tool. All right, awesome. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, And feel free to find me and ask me any more questions.